Hello, good afternoon. I'm Alec Hogg, and as you can see on screen, we have Herman Mashaba from The People's Dialogue. Interesting uh, title, uh, Herman. Last time we saw each other in person, and if you would you remember it? It was at. Uh, oh, my goodness. So, you know, Alec, um, I can tell you, must be six, seven, eight years. Uh, that is the last time I've ever seen you. Uh, but obviously, fortunate enough, I uh, read about you literally on a daily basis. and. Uh, are you still up in uh, in Natal? Because uh, no. you leave us in Johannesburg. When I'm back. Yeah. I'm back in the in the big smoke, Johannesburg. Uh, we're in WeWork, and uh, we'll be uh, um, well. We'll be talking. The last time Herman and I saw each other, in fact, was at St Francis, where we played golf in uh, what oh, was. Oh yeah. The, in so you the, remember you Bantla. used to take us there every every year. Um, uh, to St. Francis and really give us a really mm. great a few days of obviously golf would really be part of it but I think uh, the kind of speakers you used to uh, uh, to really bring forward to a really quite amazing human beings and yeah. uh, it's unfortunate that you are not uh, running that, uh, those sessions any longer. Well maybe we're going to start it again so who knows. Herman what I'm going to do now because I can see uh, you got your colleague there to sort out. Yes, uh, uh, yes. So we, uh, Andre is sorting me out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're on the phone. So we'll yeah. carry on. Andre, you're welcome to log off. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to tell him, Herman, you can log off and log back in. Um, yeah, okay. But says you can log off and log yeah, in back. Okay. Because we've, we've yeah, still got... busy with that, but in the yeah, meantime, we, we, we can get we on. We can yeah. get on. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, as far as we're going to be talking today about the change or the big judgment of a week ago, uh, which is changing the Electoral Act. But before we do that, and we will be bringing in Teresa Conradi in a mo in a little while. She is the lawyer who is working uh, on that whole process, which has been going on, as you well know, for three years mm -hmm. uh, to finally get to the judgment. But let's just just go back a little. Herman, I'm getting feedback. Yeah, it looks like I'm using the sound, but not the sound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, then I'm hoping the, the that screen, if you switch off your phone. Yeah, that's good. So am I am I done trouble okay. with the other now? Yeah, I just can't. I can't take it back. Yeah, that's fine. fine. If you switch off. Okay, phone, it looks like now I'm fine. I, I don't have to use the phone. Do you hear me? Correct. Okay. We can switch the phone off. I do apologize yeah, for uh, apologies yeah, to yeah. all of the people who are in the webinar, and there are uh, nearly 800 people who are watching our little technical issue, but we've got it now, Herman. So. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. thanks, Andre. And fortunate. thank you so much for, for your understanding. You know, some of us, um, I'm sure Alec, you know, was born uh, in a small village in a Amanskral called Haramuti. So, Unfortunately, the bush can't get out of me. So, you know, when from time to time we get into this uh, technical issues, and I'm 60 years old there as well. So, you, you know, but, but I try. Well, and, <laughs> and if, if, the, if the truth be told, if you had Connie there with you, I'm sure she would have sorted this out in two ticks, uh, Mrs. Mashaba. Um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we, we, we she left quite early to, uh, to get to the office. I'm working from home, uh, from my little office, uh, uh, study room, uh, actually to fighting to, to, to save our country because this People's Dialogue is truly about saving the country. I decided three years ago to, to stop being an armchair critic and uh, have uh, the one conference after the other. But in the meantime, the, the country was sliding down and I decided I'm not going anywhere. Let me read them. If I fail, I will fail after having tried. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And really, really proud of uh, Teresa and her team for the outstanding work, really watershed uh, uh, judgment. And I think uh, South Africans really need to recognize the role that they've played in, 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 in this judgment. 
Well, we're going to be uh, talking a lot more about that in a moment. But before we get there, our general manager, Stuart Lohman, is uh, looking after the technology for us in the back end, uh, Herman. So we've, we've got the front end sorted on your side. Stu, do you want to just take us through uh, how people can post uh, questions sure. and make sure everyone can hear us? Excellent. Thanks, Alec. I think my job was done with all the technical move around here. So thanks for that. Um, if you can see Herman and Alec on the screen and hear the voice, Alec's voice, or my voice, sorry, and then there's a Herman Mashabas image on the presentation. If you can see all of that and hear my voice and give me a high five, I'll know we're all in good stead there. Let me see. Excellent, Alec. I've got a few high fives coming through, um, so that's good. As Alex said, in those new to our webinars, we do like to keep them very conversational, and that's driven by the users themselves. So if you can please put your questions into the control panel on the right-hand side. There's a little drop-down menu there. Plop them in there and Alec will pass them on to Herman and Therese when she joins us. But all good, my side, Alec. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Stu. You can see lots of high fives. Um, and I see we're over 800 people on the webinar today. So thanks once again. A very big turnout for our noontime webinar here with the Biz News community. Herman, uh, before we get into the judgment, just the reason I, I, I didn't want to talk golf or anything, but the reason I, I was reminiscing a little was when we, at that point in time, you're a, a leading businessman in South Africa. You really had the world at your feet, if you like, going into whatever company you would have wanted to, any board you could have gone on to. But you decided instead to go into politics. And uh, at the time, it was a surprise to many of us who know you. Um, just take us through that that mindset, why you went into politics and became, surprisingly to most people, the mayor of uh, Johannesburg uh, in the Democratic Alliance. And then you left there. And as you say, you're now doing something completely different. So it's a big move from being an entrepreneur and building a, a very successful business to becoming part of the political establishment. Very interesting, um, really, Jenny. Uh, something that I never thought in my wildest dream that I would one day become a public servant. But I was really driven by events of our, of, of our country over the last 26 years uh, because I grew up never thinking that one day I will see democracy in my lifetime, that I'll get an opportunity to be a citizen of South Africa and have the voting right. And it happened on the 27th of um, April 1994, voted for Nelson Mandela. South Africa, as you remember, became the envy of the world and we all really worked hard uh, to ensure that we succeed. The world was fully behind us. Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, uh, the, the things started just really changing. And just to really give you, uh, the, you, you know, your listeners, uh, to give them a historical context of uh, what compelled me to, to throw the head in the ring to be a public servant. You know, in 90, uh, this period between 1990 and 1994, before we, voted, we went for elections, Honestly and truly, I never believe South Africa will uh, see a peaceful transition because the way the National Party had divided us along racial lines, use of coercion, use force, I thought it is, it's impossible to, that you can get black and white South Africans uh, to work together. But uh, Mandela and the Lex Magic, I don't know what they did, was, was an outstanding, you know. By that time when the negotiations were happening at Codesa, I was, as you are aware, I was already doing business in South Africa. I had a state-of-the-art 6,000 square meter factory right in the township because that was the only place I could operate. But I was already seeing signs that, you know what, this country is going to collapse. And luckily doing business in, in, in South Africa, in Southern Africa, I was already doing good business in Zimbabwe. And I felt, you know what, in Zimbabwe at the time, there were cranes all over. Zimbabwe was, was an amazing country. The growth, the enthusiasm there. I then managed to convince my wife that, you know what, in the event South Africa collapses, let's uh, start investing in Zimbabwe. Let's move our manufacturing base uh, uh, there and manage to get one of the Zimbabwean companies to do contract manufacturing for me on some of the easier products uh, to make. Fortunate enough for me, you know, my life is always determined by, by, by someone upstairs. On the 17th of November 1993, on the eve of elections, someone decided to touch my factory. 
overnight I've actually the, the 6,000 square meter state of the art uh, business cost me at the time I mean 10 million rents and I didn't owe anyone a cent for right in the heart of the township product uh, business activity in the township was just destroyed overnight by isonist and um, obviously we already focused uh, immediately on rebuilding this then the elections and uh, the question of uh, Zimbabwe to, I had to put it aside because uh, I had to rebuild my current business. And fortunately enough, um, elections were successful. South Africa was successful. Now, when South Africa started uh, showing signs of uh, disintegration like it happened in Zimbabwe, that's when I said, you know what? Running away is not an option. So the best way is to, you know, with my fortunate position, if it is not me who, and I was really lucky that Queen and my, my family gave me the support to say, look, we're not going anywhere. We've been privileged family for the last 35 odd years or so. We are happy. If you feel comfortable to try, go and try. If you fail, that's fine. Now, there are so many things in life. Uh, some you win, some you lose. But this one is an important battle for you to, uh, to go and try. And uh, that's really what led me into 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 uh, politics. I threw my head in the ring for for uh, for the DA when they managed to uh, to convince me to be the mayoral candidate for the city of Johannesburg. Did you think you'd win? You know, uh, Alec. For me, um, I always tell people about this. Very important. Uh, you know, I lost my father at the age of two, and I had my grandfather, this young, big, Shangan man called Gus Mashaba. You know, this old man, for some reason, I was everything to him. You know, I was his life. And um, he used to be a security guy at the gate of the Harangua municipality. So he used to come home by bicycle in a month, once a month. Once a month. Uh, the time when he was there, you know, I was everything to him, and he used to really uh, uh, teach me invaluable uh, life lessons uh, about life. And one thing that he taught me that everything that um, I do, I must do it to win. And he says, look, you're not going to succeed in everything, but the only time you will know you've succeeded uh, or you failed is after trying. So I don't, anything in life I do, I don't do it to, to play second fiddle. I do everything to win. And I made it clear, ask a TA a week after I was elected as the, as the, as the, as the mayoral candidate. I wanted after FedEx, when they were having a press conference, I pleaded with them to say, please tell South Africa that um, we are going to win Joe Berg, Nelson Mandela and so on. That was uh, late January of 2016, when, when before I even went on uh, this thing. Uh, they, they they refused to ask any of, of them, James Self or Musi, asked them what I said in, in, in the day because I was invited to the Federal Council. I said, guys, South Africa, we've just had um, uh, the national address where uh, Jacob Zuma didn't say anything, depressed us. So I said, South Africans are looking for good news. Just tell them you've put together a team of mayors that are going to win those metros. So <clears throat> what I do... I do everything to win. Well, uh, I'm <coughs> pleased to tell you that uh, Teresa Conradi has also joined us now. Teresa, are you battling? We're we battling to see you, but we certainly should be able to hear you. I think I'm managing now um, and should be uh, able to share an image with you in a few moments. We've got you 100%. We've got there you on go. the screen. All well, you're looking, uh, you, you're properly framed and uh, and lovely to have you. We've been talking a little uh, about the background of Herman Mashaba, but a little bit about your background. Uh, the company that, and it's up on the screen now, uh, the company that, that you're the MD of was the driving force behind this seismic uh, judgment that we had uh, just a week ago today, um, it's interesting to note to note that you're an all-woman company. I know my my friend Kevin Wakeford tells me, and you you're also non-racial, so you've uh, you really are positioned for the new South Africa. But maybe just start off with this challenge to the Electoral Act and why you picked up the cudgels and and uh, took it through the courts. 
Yes, Alec, we really had the privilege of taking it to the Constitutional Court as the uh, last lap in a, in a big relay that lots of wonderful people started off. So I have to um, really uh, recognize people like Michael Louis that took it to the Constitutional Court and was turned down in his individual capacity. Capacity, Mosia Lakota that brought a private members bill in Parliament. And then um, the, the applicants, the New Nation Movement, uh, small, not high profile, they were even called obscure by the court civil society movement with uh, Princess Chantal Ravel of, of the New Nation. So um, Merlin Titus, an attorney from Cape Town, and uh, Alan Nelson, senior counsel from Cape Town, they took the matter up to the Western Cape High Court where um, the application was turned down. And uh, we, uh, our firm, Mapala Mukati Kunradi, MMC Incorporated, picked it up from there and uh, took it to the, to the Constitutional Court. As you say, we are all all female firm started off in 1997, one of the first multicultural mm. uh, law firms in South Africa. And I thought that it was one of the good news stories in this uh, recent time where there's been so much violence against women. So it was really re the result of my passion over 25 years for, for women empowerment. We're very proud to be associated with this guy. How's it going to change politics in South Africa? Alec, I think it would uh, be a mistake to believe that it's not going to change politics in South Africa. Certainly, um, whatever Parliament does, it would need to meet the requirements of this court order. And uh, it couldn't dilute the court order by making a small minority of the parliamentarians independent candidates. So um, in, in layperson's terms, I tell my friends, never again you will have the option to only vote for a political party. You will actually have the opportunity to, to vote for an individual. So the way I see it happening now is court has given Parliament 24 months. It would be very interesting to see uh, who the political parties deploy to the Home Affairs um, Portfolio Committee, where this will, will, will uh, be drafted. It will then be um, very important for public participation for Parliament to actually decide what the proportion will be of the 400 parliamentarians, how many of them would actually be um, independent uh, candidates and how many elected according to the party, uh, the proportional representation of the parties. Now, if I could just quickly refer back to the Fonsal Slubbert report on which uh, our clients relied heavily. Um, the Fonsal Slubbert report even recommended that 75% of all parliamentarians be independent candidates, but I can't see that happening. So that will be the first important um, uh, important decision for that uh, or recommendation for that committee to make. The second would be on which basis, whether we are going to look at the constituency basis. Now, our clients with the legal teams were very careful not to be prescriptive and try and already propose an electoral system because we believe that that will be a red herring and that it will just um, invite too much um, too much speculation. So if it goes according to the constituency system, I think there will be many, many battles about the demarcations of constituencies. And then there's a host of other legislation that needs to be considered, whether individual candidates or independent candidates will have to meet the same requirements that political parties now have to meet to be able to register. It would um, definitely affect the allocation that Parliament now makes to political parties for um, uh, 
uh, funds to be able to canvas. It affects the pensions, uh, the benefits of parliamentarians. So, so we've got our work as a civil society cut out for ourselves over the next 24 months. We've also got, uh, or you've got your work cut out, you and Herman, in uh, answering questions because they have flooded through. Just to remind everyone, we can't open your microphones. There are literally 850 people on this webinar and that would uh, create a cacophony. But what we can do is take your questions if you uh, type them in at the bottom in the uh, little question bar. Uh, there's, a, there's a question mark on your screen there. Click there, send your questions through, and I'm going to ask our uh, is guests to answer the uh, those questions for you. The first one uh, that came through was from Adrian Funky, who says, Pierre de Force tweeted an article which essentially says the judgment won't change much. What are your thoughts on that? Not sure if you saw the article. Teresa, you want to have a go? I indeed saw the article, but uh, I think it would very much depend on whether this is just going to pass by um, ordinary citizens of the country or whether they are going to take a real interest. And I, I, I can't agree with Pierre de Force. I think over the last few years, perhaps starting with the various motions of no confidence in uh, former President um, uh, uh, Zuma, that ordinary citizens are now looking at individuals. They are measuring individuals to, as far as their compassion, their integrity, their decisiveness is concerned. And this was, in a way, for me, the one of the highlights of, of this COVID period, where across the world, um, leaders are now being assessed in a, in, a, in a personal capacity. So it would really depend on the citizens of this country whether it's going to change the political landscape or not. Herman? Can I just really expand on this, uh, uh, Alex? And uh, Teresa, congratulations uh, for really exceptional work. We're really proud of you as far as fellow South Africans uh, to really come out with such a watershed uh, concord. Whatever people are saying, I can tell you what you've achieved uh, is going to have uh, an impact. Fortunate enough, you can really study history. Let me share something what we, we've, we've done, and I've already made announcements to that uh, effect that as part of the People's Dialogue, I'll be launching a new political party in August uh, this year. So in just over a month's time, be launching a new political party with five core values. One of the core values is electoral reform. I've committed to South Africans. I'm working, it's really spending a lot of money with uh, to technology. Our uh, the, uh, the public representatives, who are going to represent us uh, in local government elections uh, in national in 2024 are not going to be elected by us as a political party. We are going to run primaries like we're doing in the United States. So we don't even, uh, uh, Teresa, have to really wait uh, for the amendments because government uh, and parliament can take time. What we are going to do is uh, once, once we launch the political party, I hope our technology will be ready by then that we can register people in, in, in municipalities where we're going to contest because we are not going to this time around next year contest all local, all uh, the 278 municipalities, humanly not possible. We've identified the ones which are winnable. What we're going to do is we're going to register people in, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, in that ward and uh, the, anyone interested in becoming a ward councillor, whether it's two or three or four people, we are going to subject them to the community of that ward. They are the ones who are going to decide uh, to be the one who's going to go into the ballot box, not uh, someone decided by us uh, as a political party behind the closed doors. And we're going to do this in 2024 when we go to, um, to national elections. Everyone who's going to be representing us uh, in parliament will be elected by the community from where they come. It, they are not going to be elected by us behind closed doors. So this, I think, uh, this court judgment uh, really gives meat to what we are going to do. And we don't really have to really wait for politicians who are there to save themselves. We are going to start actually practicing to really make sure that uh, public representatives 
are actually directly elected by the people. It is possible. We don't have to really wait for constitutional amendments. Again, uh, there's many questions here, many statements. Uh, people supporting you, Herman, saying, well done. There's one here from Melanie Minar for you, Teresa. It says, thanks for all you're doing for empowerment and women's rights. I'm going to start, though, with another question here from Claudius van Weyck, uh, Dr. Claudius van Weyck, who uh, I know very well and often contributes to Biz News. He says, this is some vindication of Ansel Slabert's work, which was ignored by Mbeki. It broke his heart. Is that so, Teresa? Yes, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. It was, it was a phenomenal piece of work that Dr. Van Slobert and his and his team did. And um, it, uh, if one thinks about it, it's nearly twenty years ago, and um, it gave us all the necessary direction that we needed, and it also gave us a sense that um, this is not new. This is something that had already actually not only been ac accepted by Parliament, but Dr. Van Sylslobert had been mandated to do it. So the only reason that I could think of why the recommendations of the report were not accepted is because it didn't suit the ruling party uh, at the time. And it would have it would have impacted hugely on the the outright majority that the ruling party had uh, then. But I, I completely agree, and um, I was always a fan of Dr. Van Sylslobert, and I hope he's smiling down upon us and um, being being happy with what we've achieved. I'm sure he is. He, in fact, uh, Herman, you might remember he was at one of our bundlers going back. We have to resuscitate that van. Uh, and probably a year before he died, uh, was giving us the insight into what was happening there. Fascinating and a, a real hero of South Africa. Um, that will get his acknowledgement, uh, not just uh, not just in this judgment, but I'm sure as we look back in history, time to come. Philip uh, Nokomowitz. Is asks, what is the future for the role of citizens in a South African political environment that uh, you envisage? Do you want to give that a go, Herman? Yeah, you know, uh, Alec, if, uh, you know, one huge responsibility we have uh, is to get South Africans to wake up uh, to our democratic dispensation, that the success of this country is not dependent on politicians, on, on parliament is dependent on active uh, citizenship. You know, once uh, people can actually begin the process of holding politicians accountable, instead of staying away from voting, I'm sure you're aware in the last elections we had just under 19 million South Africans who did not bother to vote, only just over 17 million. So we had more South Africans staying away because uh, for some reason they claim not to have any political party that they can align to. But the danger of actually civil society uh, taking such an approach, we end up with a political party that's today in government. That is every election they lose plus minus two million voters. But unfortunately, they're still in power. Who put them into power? They were put into power by the 19 million South Africans who did not go out and vote. Because if you can imagine, if 25% of them had just gone out to vote, this country today will be having a different uh, government. So I think the responsibility is to actually conscientize and educate our people. And, it's, and what I find really very fascinating, because during the People's Dialogue, we did a lot of research on this, that the majority of the people who stayed away from uh, from voting, these are educated, well-informed citizens, are not the ones that you can buy with a T-shirt or a food parcel. So I think we have a responsibility to really educate them. But I think through our platform, we've been extremely successful. You know, when I launched this project, uh, and my family put in money as a gift to South Africa, was to get South Africans to engage. And for me, when with my team, I said, if we can get half a million people actually giving us the mandate, would really be a good sample. We ended up with 2.4 million submissions. I mean, it, 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 wow. it blew my mind, totally, totally blew my mind. 2.4 million submissions. Just two days ago, on June 16, we had a webinar session with the youth of this country from various universities all over the country. 
I was really very inspired. I remember two, three weeks ago when I was invited by the students that we host them through the People's Dialogue on June 16th. I was nervous because of um, the experience of the militancy that we see on our television screens and so forth. I'm telling you that um, the, the session is it's, uh, it's on our website. You look at the quality of um, of our uh, our youth in this country of all colors, all genders. You will really get to uh, uh, be pleased that our country is safe. But we need to really get the 19 million South Africans to go out and vote come the next elections. Then one day when this country's economy is uh, under 5%, I'm happy for you to stay away, not hold government accountable. But right now, to, with a country to where we have a chance by end of this year, we're going to sit with almost 60% unemployment. Honestly, to sit back and expect someone else to do it for you. Unfortunately, you are failing the future of your children and grandchildren. Herman, thanks for that. Uh... Uh, Dina Chetty has a question which I think many others are asking uh, for Teresa, you'd be able to unpack this for us. She asks, is it correct that the judgment now compels Parliament to develop a constituency-based electoral system in which individual candidates can only stand in a single district? Um, Ali, perhaps just before I uh, reply to that, if I could just add on to what Herman was saying. The New Nation Movement identified a number of groups that they feel have been marginalised by our current electoral system. And the first one was the youth. The youth don't have the same historical loyalties that people of our age group have. So they are also because of social media and being part of the global um, global community, they, they have other requirements for leaders. So I completely agree with, with them. And I am so excited to see which young people are going to make themselves available as, as independent candidates. And that would bring back a large portion of the electorate. The second one are women. You know, women generally, they just put their um, heads down and they work and they look after their children and they serve in their communities and they have nobody representing them with their hardships. Uh, so, so if they at least have a, a closer connection to the people representing them, they can really ask for assistance, they can really um, hold, uh, hold their leaders accountable. The third one was the faith communities. I've been working in the faith communities for the last 25 years of my life, and there's been great disillusionment, and there's been a great unhappiness with, with um, faith communities feeling that, um, th that there's no um, representation for their concern over moral decline, et cetera, et cetera. But to get back to, to the question, no, the... the uh, uh, the Constitutional Court simply declared the Electoral Act unconstitutional for as far as it does not make provision for, ind for independent candidates. And the unconstitutionality has been suspended for 24 months. So if they hadn't um, uh, suspended it, uh, you know, it would have just been unconstitutional and we would have sat with a, with a big dilemma. But now, um, Parliament, it's up to Parliament to design a new electoral system that gives effect to the Constitutional Court's judgment. So it could be a ward constituency type of system. That's what seems most obvious and that seems most practical. But um, they could come up with some some magic formula which we haven't haven't thought about. But again, I just want to remind South African citizens that their participation is always um, important and they are allowed to participate. The, the small civil society group that took um, uh, the government to, to task in the Pretoria High Court around the constitutionality of the regulations, 
That's the beauty of this. The new nation movement does not consist of high profile people. They had absolutely no funding. The same goes for Princess Chantelle Ravel of the First Nation. So, so it's now time for us to involve ourselves and decide whether the constitutional, uh, whether the constituency um, uh, mechanism and framework is the best for, for our system. That's so interesting listening to you and uh, Herman a little earlier. Uh, when I talk to fellow South Africans and people internationally, many global South Africans, they bemoil the fact that we have gangsters and criminals uh, in parliament, yet we have such amazing people outside of it. Uh, we, we punch way above our weight on a global stage. Uh, Elon Musk is changing the world, and, uh, and he comes from Pretoria, where you come from, Teresa. Uh, we, we have uh, one of the, well, the owner of the LA Times is from South Africa as well, um, and so on. You could, you could continue the, the biggest private equity uh, um, firm in the United States, Sequoia Capital, is run by a guy called Rulof Buerta, also from South Africa. So. Uh, and then you think of people like uh, Mokosi Koza, uh, Herman, who's now outside of parliament. Tuli Maronzeda, if we had a vote for president in South Africa, I wonder who would win between Ramaphosa and Maronzela. It'd be a very close contest, and so on and so forth. So what you've done, uh, many South Africans might just wake up to the reality that we can also get good people into parliament as uh, these same good people that, that are outside. But it's not for me to to be uh, on a soapbox or anything, but it, I just feel that way after what you were saying. Uh, Graham Hill asks, he says, a good move, but given that we need a very strong opposition to the ANC, won't this move to have independence end up splitting the vote and make the opposition divided and weak? You know, uh, if I may come Herman, in. Uh, would you like uh, to give that a go? I, I like yeah, I uh, personally don't actually believe uh, that would really be the case. So you look at, I've, remember, I've already indicated uh, the decline, massive decline of the ANC over the last uh, few elections, and they're going to get further decline. So the only way we can obviously really bring in a new dispensation in this country, regardless of who you vote for, it's a question of uh, the 19 million South Africans to go out and actually vote because um, uh, the ANC's uh, vote, uh, as you're aware, was uh, just, uh, just under 10 million people, the, the voters that they had. So you can imagine, um, the, and now come the next elections, I can tell you they're going to drop by another two to three million uh, the votes. So if you want to remove um, the ANC from government, it's a question of actually putting uh, whether it's another five or six uh, different political parties that we must go into a coalition. Because one thing that we cannot deny, South Africa is facing and is going to face a coalition arrangement uh, for the next I don't know how many years. And personally, I'm actually right now in favor of uh, coalition arrangement because it keeps uh, government in check that you don't really have the luxury of abusing your power. And um, whether I like it or not, that's if you're a, a, a historian or a political scientist, coalition is the future of, of this country. As long as I think for me personally, I'm, I'm on a journey to unseat the ANC. And whoever takes over, it doesn't matter whether it's going to be the five or I was running a seven way multi party government. Let us really run multi party government. One day we will get it right. But we cannot allow a situation where right now well, our country is known internationally to really be a gangster state. You know, I remember um, on three or successive occasions uh, in 18 months, in, in a year, going to, to, to New York. At the airport by New York Times, South Africa will be, for some reason, I don't know why it coincided uh, with my travel. At the airport, as I get in by the, the New York Times, South Africa will be on the headlines. People are obviously being really uh, educated about uh, staying away from South Africa because uh, we've got a criminal government in South Africa. 
it, it is there. I'm sure to, I let you must have really read uh, those articles. Uh, so we are known internationally that our, our government is, a, is, a, is a, a criminal enterprise, and it's up to about it's uh, it's up to the people of South Africa if they want a credible ethical leadership, that ethical leadership has to be decided by South Africans. It can't be decided by the English or the French or the Americans. As people of South Africa are the ones who must really take that responsibility. Well, someone else who is being, uh, and we, we really do have a lot of questions. I'm not sure how many of them we'll be able to get through, but uh, this one I would like to, to raise for you, Teresa. It's from Dr. Corne Mulder, uh, MP. He says, I'm afraid the judgment is not going to change much. The Constitutional Court, way back in certifying the current Constitution in 1996, made it clear that the Constitutional Assembly chose to make political parties the vehicle to exercise the political will of the electorate. My question is, where in the judgment is provision made that the independent candidates should be treated differently than other candidates and that exclusive seats for independents should be provided for? Um, it's it's a fairly long answer, but um, if one listens to all of the arguments in court, then there's absolutely no doubt that um, this is exactly what the um, what the judgment says. The the judgment speaks about the um, the content of the political rights of a South African citizen. In other words. Um, not only the right to vote, but also the right to stand for public office. So if, if, if one looks at um, the, uh, the, the judgment in depth, there's absolutely no uh, doubt that the judgments uh, or that the mandate for, for, the, uh, for Parliament is to make sure that uh, the electoral system is redesigned to make um, provision for independent candidates. There's no, pres uh, there's no prescription, they're not saying how many, but certainly if uh, Parliament dilutes the judgment by having a small minority, uh, available uh, or a, a number of seats available, we will certainly take the matter back to the Constitutional Court and ask the Constitutional Court to again declare um, the Electoral Act um, unconstitutional. If I could just once again come back to the whole question of a strong op opposition. Remember, Parliament is our legislator and it's all about the numbers game. And if one's got the majority, whether the individual parliamentarian, whether it's against his or her conscience or not, they must vote along the party lines. So if, mm. if, if the uh, ruling party no longer has the majority in terms of numbers, anything is possible. It's not even necessary for all of the independent candidates to agree, but it will no longer be possible for the uh, ruling party to simply push through legislation that uh, the majority of South Africans don't agree with. It's, it's extraordinary, actually, that we had so many uh, or so much support from everybody in the ANC for a corrupt president, and they all now disown him uh, and the nine lost years, et cetera, and forgetting that they kept him there by going through and having secret votes to do that. It, it's extraordinary. When I have a look from, from our perspective, where we come from, from the economy, from the business world, it's all changing. The fourth industrial revolution has dramatically changed that. So surely politics has to change as well. And uh, perhaps this is the judgment that's going to do it. Uh, there was a question from Alexandra Herbert for you, Teresa. Was Rolf Mayer involved in this process? Because he would have an interesting historical perspective to this judgment. No, Ruf wasn't wasn't involved in um, in in the lead up to the judgments, and I would like love to hear his um, his view on it. I can remember years ago I shared a platform with him in Washington, and he was challenging the Americans whether um, their system of two major parties or whether our system of uh, 46 uh, possibilities on the ballot paper, which uh, is a better reflection of two true democracy. So I'd love to hear Rolf's view on this. 
Stuart Pennington, um, a former um, neighbour of mine in the Midlands in KZN, asks, what will Parliament look like in 2024? Herman, do you want to have a go? <laughs> God, I, I, I wish uh, I had such uh, foresight. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. It's going to be, without any doubt, uh, different to, uh, to what it is. But exactly at this point in time, there are so many dynamics. I mean, uh, this uh, COVID-19 has really brought in a, a totally new dimension to our country's uh, political landscape. But secondly, uh, I like something that you're very familiar with. Uh, our economy right now is in ICU. And it went into ICU. It was on the stretcher to be uh, to be pushed into the ICU before the lockdown. So the coronavirus has got absolutely nothing to do with our economy before we, uh, before we had this pandemic. We were already on a stretcher into the ICU. And right now we're in the economy of South Africa, whether people want to accept it or not, it's in ICU and we don't have the necessary surgeons or experienced surgeons to actually resuscitate uh, um, this body. So we're in a very difficult situation. If one can answer whether South Africa is going to survive the economic impact of our current situation, that is something for me personally gives me sleepless nights because as the ANC collapses and they are collapsing, I really pray hard that uh, they must not collapse with the country like what happened in, in Zimbabwe because this economy to really revive and get back uh, to um, to normality. Honestly, we need uh, to work hard, but we need a divine intervention because uh, um, this patient in ICU, the surgeons around them, they have absolutely no clue whatsoever how to deal with the economy. The only thing they can tell you is about Russia uh, and the Soviet Union experience and so forth. They have no clue how to resuscitate and get this body uh, to start living again. So we, we, we're watching very closely uh, personally. I'm waiting for next week uh, to see how the, the new um, uh, budget is going to really look like. I hate uh, to be um, the Minister of Finance in this country because he's facing major, major challenges because the revenue stream, as uh, the Commission of SARS has already indicated, 285 billion, I can tell you it's going to be worse than that. I, you know, I'm not at, uh, an economist or a, a financial guru, but I know a little bit about money from the days of gambling in the townships as a, as a young boy. I can tell you our revenue to collection is going to be worth is going to be worse, worse than what it is. Our unemployment rate is going to be worse than what they are, they, they are predicting. So all these dynamics, unfortunately, can really lead to something that is really scary. I'm even really sometimes uh, um, too scared to really to talk about it in in this. But I think. If we pray hard as South Africans, if we can hold um, government accountable, and for some reason, I uh, really hope we can get a president who can take decisions, decisive. In fact, uh, you said later this afternoon, um, uh, I'm busy right now with an opinion piece. I'll release it this afternoon because I get disappointed by the president. Last night, uh, you stand in front of the nation, the nation, that with an economy that's in ICU, you don't really deal with those matters. So I think, and I really hope every time, more especially when I talk to captains of industry, because they're the ones who believed in Cyril Ramaphosa. And now from day one, when Cyril Ramaphosa was, was elected as, as, a, as a president, the, um, South Africans know my views. I said, to, we've, got a wrong, we've got a wrong man to lead this country, but obviously for the captains of industries really supported him. And I'm asking him, you, you've got close ties with the settle. Please, can you ask him to really provide leadership to this country? Teresa, uh, would you like to give us your thoughts of where, what parliament would look like in 2024? Let me tell you what I dream for Parliament would look like in in 2024. I would I would dream that the traditional communities, the traditional leaders, that the people of the First Nation, 
are represented there by their real leaders. I would dream that um, the de facto community leaders in communities now at the moment, the pastors, the school principals, those people who, who, who are in touch with their communities, who understand the hardships and the dreams and the aspiration of, of, of those communities, that they will be sitting in parliament. I was just speaking to somebody as to what an educational task there would be for all of these uh, independent candidates that have never been part of the legislative process. But be that as it may, this is a new season uh, for our country and um, we're, we're, we're real leaders, de facto leaders of integrity, um, of, um, of that have got proven support will, will sit in Parliament. Call, call me the, the ultimate dreamer and the ultimate optimist, but that is what I hope for. But that's happened in France, on Marche France. Uh, pulled people in there when uh, when when uh, Emmanuel Macron was was voted in with a landslide. The people who came in were school teachers, scientists, um, truck drivers. Uh, many, the majority of En Marche France, were people who had no political experience. So it's not really that far fetched as it as it might seem, given that we've had the judgment. Uh, Ntabaleng Kakao would like to know or maybe it's a statement, is saying it's about time that we as South Africans do not elect parties, but individuals. The ruling party has really held people of South Africa hostage. There's no development at all, and people are really frustrated. Uh, there's another uh, uh, comment here from Guy Hamlin, who says, Herman, you strike me as a very principled individual and one who's likely to get my support, but only if you clearly explain why you compromise those principles through your very public support of the EFF. <laughs> very interesting uh, <laughs> issue. To, I, I think I find this really very strange when you run a coalition government of uh, the, having 38% and you rely on other parties, including the EFF and the Freedom Front Plus. You know, uh, that's something that I find actually completely weird. And local government is not about political ideologies. It's about uh, providing toilets, uh, roads, uh, and so forth in 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 in, uh, in 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 your in your gov in your government. And if EFF and I agree that uh, we 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 have to go and provide uh, toilets to a community informal settlement that had never had uh, the toilets for 24 years under the ANC government and the Freedom Front Plus. I find it difficult when uh, people say, uh, I must uh, the accept and I, I must deal with the Freedom Front Plus, and I have respect for them. The very same thing that applies with the EFF, because without the EFF support, I will not really be able to really pass any report in, in, in council. At the national level, absolutely, it's a totally different ballgame because the EFF and I, we come from two totally different economic, ideological perspectives. It will be almost impossible to, to really agree. But at local government level, when we must fix the substation, we agree that uh, I come to with a report, the uh, ANC in, in council, ANC rejects it, EFF, Freedom Front Plus, and others support me. Uh, and people said, no, I must not get the support from EFF. That means, so, okay, then the government will collapse because for you to run government, unfortunately, you have to really have the mandate of council. And the mandate of council, that means you've got to have the majority. So I don't understand the, the, the logic of uh, some people who are saying, get the support from the Freedom Front Plus only had one vote, if they're happy that I, I, I had to deal with them. Whereas EFF had 30 votes. <laughs> so uh, I don't understand the, the the logic, and that is something that we need to really face as as, as a nation to understand what local government uh, uh, it's all about and national government. Without any doubt, uh, me and, and the EFF will have major major difficulties uh, when it comes to policy level and national government level. But Thanks. at local government the level, where we must deal with social justice where I have communities right now, you know, watching under COVID-19, where 
not far from here, just across the, 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 the freeway from my house here, where people, uh, 200 families would be sharing one portable toilet. And uh, we agree we must do something about it. And then obviously someone says, no, the hell when you live in Senton, please, uh, the, our grass is too long. I only got 10 rents. Uh, what do I do, you know? But fortunate enough, residents of Johannesburg, particularly from the suburbs, every time when I engage them on this, they gave me a blank check. They says, please forget about this, uh, the politicians. We don't know who they, re they, they represent. Go and do what is best for our communities. Go and serve and give them justice. Because these are the people who are working for us. We cannot really subject uh, our people in a city which before I came into power was regarded as a world-class African city. Patrick Mamatuba uh, asks, is it not an option, and this is for you, Teresa, for Parliament to simply change the constitution to codify the current arrangement? Well, let me let me put it this way. Everything that we need to reform the electoral system is already in the constitution. And that is that is the beauty about constitutional development. So there's actually no need to change the constitution uh, to, uh, to 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 achieve that. The Constitution says the National Assembly must pass legislation which provides for an electoral act, for an electoral uh, system. So, so even in terms of the current Constitution, it, it is possible. Something that I must just perhaps mention that uh, people don't always understand is that uh, this this judgment refers to national general elections and provincial legislative elections because on municipal level there has always been the that's the way the constitution is written that's the way the underlying legislation is written there's always been a ward system where independent candidates can uh, can stand for, for election. So I'm often asked the question that if independent elect, uh, um, independent candidates have not made a huge difference on local government level, whether they will actually achieve that on provincial and national level. And I think the reason for that is that uh, it's difficult to, to duplicate a bottom up uh, pattern. It's much easier to duplicate a top-down um, uh, uh, pattern. So if we had, um, right from the start, um, independent candidates being able to stand for public office in, in the national legislature and the provincial legislature, there would have been a much greater awareness, a much greater participation in, in municipal elections. There are lots of questions about whether uh, next year's municipal elections um, can be um, postponed to, to coincide with a, a general elections in terms of the uh, constitution is of course not possible for for the current uh, municipal councils to serve later than I think November 2021. So that would require a constitutional change. But I do believe that there's going to be a gr much greater awareness with voters um, in the municipal elections as to their options of of independent candidates. Well, we've come to the end of our time, and uh, unfortunately, many of the questions were just, uh, we just weren't able to get around to it. Uh, a number of the, the comments, though, are congratulations. Mark Long says, congratulations to Teresa and Herman for the work they're doing. Hearing from them is a great encouragement. Well done to both of them and their teams. And he speaks for numerous others who put together uh, similar kinds of comments. Uh, I just want to close off with one final point, because uh, one final question rather, because this is is one that kind of encapsulates again from Claudius van Weyck. He luckily got two questions asked this time around. He says, won't we at some time need a new inclusive national convention to redefine our social contract? The constitution needs to be informed by that. As a final comment, would you like to just uh, address that question, Teresa? 
Yes, I absolutely agree. We've often spoken about a second Codesa because when the first Codesa took place, um, it, the, the whole political and national situation was, was so delicate and um, the result of, of Codesa was very often a give and take. Now we are uh, more than nearly nearly 30 years down down the line and there is a new generation there is a new um, generation of of leaders that are, there are new requirements while while our founding values remain the same uh, the society has changed greatly and now especially in this this past COVID time the fault lines have become so pronounced there where our government needs assistance to to improve whether it's water housing poverty social grants all of those things need to go back to a, a national um, forum where, where we can can agree with one another about what the priorities are for our country for the future herman a national convention to redefine well, our social well, contract Fortunate enough, um, uh, when I launched the People's Dialogue on the 6th of December, clearly we made it uh, said to South Africans that uh, here's an opportunity. The first CODESA pre-1994, politicians negotiated a great deal for themselves. That's why they will never change it. Who are the biggest beneficiaries of uh, CODESA negotiations are the politicians. And I said, uh, let us now get civil society to engage. And fortunate enough, they engaged us in big numbers. We reached over 33 million, of the 33 million, 2.4 million submissions. Some of the submissions, 125,000 of the submissions are 10 to 12 pages long. So we've really given South Africans a, a platform to, uh, to engage. As I'm talking to you right now, my team of policy experts, uh, are engaging this week, they're engaging with the youth to get the inputs of the youth. Starting from Monday, we're putting together a, a team of uh, um, law enforcement agencies uh, from retired judges, lawyers like Teresa, the, the policemen and women, where we can actually formulate uh, the kind of criminal system that is going to work for South Africa. And then we will then go into social justice. What type of social justice uh, can we have as policy consideration for, for, for our country? What type of education do we need? We we assembling team of uh, real educators and this country has got a potential of good teachers. I, I cannot just understand how we can have someone like Blake Zimande and, and um, and the Minister of Basic Education for the last 10 years, failing society dismally, spectacular, but they're being rewarded year on year. So we're getting people who are coming from the education sector, who've been uh, sidelined by the unions over the last uh, 26 years to say, look, unions must be independent of, of government. Let education be run by experts. And we're putting them together so that our policy it's actually informed by what society wants. So we've already given South Africa an opportunity to participate uh, in a CODESA. And um, so far, my family has been great enough uh, to, uh, to really put money behind uh, uh, this exercise. But obviously, going towards the political party is when we will then start in inviting other South Africans to join us on this very important journey. Herman Mashaba and uh, Teresa Conradi, it's been a privilege uh, to spend the past hour with you. Thank you for engaging uh, so honestly and frankly and for bringing us up to date on a court judgment that could, despite what uh, Pierre de Force and others like him believe, could dramatically change uh, the future of this country or at least the political governance. And man, from what we've know, lived through over the past few years, I think many members of the biz news community, for them, it can't come soon enough. Thanks again, Stuart. Just to before we log off, uh, just tell us where uh, where those who perhaps only came in part of the way can can access uh, this webinar or the recording thereof. Thanks, Alec, and thanks, Herman and Rosa, for your time. Um, yes, I've put the YouTube channel link on the chat option on the control panel, which is just below the questions drop-down menu on the user's side. So if they click on that link, 
this webinar and all our previous webinars and all the future webinars get posted onto the Biz News YouTube channel. So that should be up in the next hour or two. And it's very popular. We know that uh, the webinar uh, that uh, my colleague uh, or our colleague Linda van Tilburg had last week with Moletzi and Becky and Yaki Salia has been downloaded uh, or watched oh, almost 20,000 times. So there's good, good quality content there. And if you miss part of this conversation or if like me, you kind of need it twice to, to let it let it really sink in. Um, there's the, uh, the the link or you can just go onto YouTube and, and uh, search for Biz News. Thanks again. It's been our privilege. We'll be back again with Noon Time Thursday at noon on Thursday next week. Well, then I'm Alec Hogg. Cheerio. Cheerio.